Welcome to Cambridge Forum. I also want to commend all of you for coming out on a bitterly cold night. That includes those of you at home watching on C-SPAN. Um, we commend you for coming when it's so cold. We're here to talk about that issue that has all but disappeared from American public discussion. I'm going to use the word that they don't quite use, class. It's in the title, but it means something different in the title than we used to mean. Tonight we're discussing the near poor in America, a group of more than 50 million people who are often overlooked by policymakers, but not by authors Catherine Newman and Victor Tan Chin. Thank you very much. I'm E.J. Graff, senior researcher at Brandeis University's Schuster Institute for Investigative Journalism. We hear about poverty almost often enough. We hear about wealth all too often. But when does this nation discuss what it's like to live right on the edge of poverty, taking three buses to get to your job or, and being just one sick child away from losing that? When do we talk about how hard it is for someone to pass her MCAS exams or, and let's not even talk about the SATs, when she's working every night at Burger King in order to help the family feed itself? When do we talk about how grim your prospects are if your job offers very sketchy health insurance, the kind that won't pay for essential diagnostic tests or the specialists you might need if you get a rare cancer? Catherine Newman and Victor Tan Chen are ready to change that invisibility with their new book, which takes us into the daily struggles of nine missing class families. Here's what Senator John Edwards writes in his preface. You'll find yourself, as I did, rooting for each and every one of them. Their grit and determination are extraordinary. In sharing their lives and struggles, these families have done more to educate the nation than any set of statistics or government report ever could. Just so you have the visual, here's the book. Catherine Newman is Malcolm S. Forbes Class of 1941, Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at Princeton, and author of eight award-winning books on poverty, downward mobility, and school violence, including Shoots and Ladders, Navigating the Low-Wage Labor Market, and No Shame in My Game, The Working Poor in the Inner City. Victor Tan Chen is a Harvard doctoral candidate in sociology and social policy. He is founding editor and president of In the Fray magazine, a publication that seeks to question, inform, and inspire conversation about identity and community. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Catherine Newman. Thank you very much, EJ, and thank you to our friends and colleagues at the Cambridge Forum and all of their loyal supporters. Uh, we, too, are grateful that you came out on such a cold night to talk about a difficult subject, a subject that I would argue uh, belongs back on the table. Uh, we have a lot of unfinished business in the United States. We have been focusing, understandably, on our exploits overseas, on the war in Iraq, uh, and forgetting that we have millions of Americans who are in trouble and need our support and opportunity in the labor market. We have come tonight to talk about a group of people who, as EJ pointed out, tend to be off the radar screen. They are not tracked by the Census Bureau. We don't pay attention to whether we have more of them or fewer of them as time goes by. Why are they off the radar screen? Well, one of the reasons is they're so busy working that they're not really busy causing anybody any trouble. They aren't using public benefits because they're not eligible for them for the most part. They tend not to be, sadly, politically very active, so they aren't exercising a voice at the ballot box that would cause politicians to pay much attention to them. Essentially, so they're struggling so hard to survive, to stay above that poverty line, that they're too busy to cause the rest of us very much trouble, and as a result, we don't pay very much attention to them. But the near poor, those are Americans who live in families of four with incomes between twenty dollars and $40,000 a year, so people who live up to twice the federal poverty line, constitute something like one in six Americans. And it's sort of stunning that we don't recognize their existence, because one in six is actually a pretty big number. 
As EJ mentioned, that's over 50 million people. To put this in perspective, about 37 million Americans fall below the poverty line, and they are truly destitute, and they deserve all the attention uh, that we provide for them and more. But 50, 53 million is a big number. Uh, that's a lot of people to be uh, in trouble in the way the families we want to talk about tonight are. Um, and when that includes nearly 21% of the nation's children, we especially need to pay attention because that's the future of the nation. That is a growing population uh, whose options in the future will determine whether this is a productive nation, whether this is a prosperous nation, or whether it's a nation rent by inequality of the kind that EJ was mentioning. There are actually two routes into this category of the near poor. One route, which I wrote about years ago, involves people who are middle class or working class who fall down into this group. They lose their jobs, they lose their health insurance, they lose their houses, and they find themselves resting, if you will, inside this rather desperate condition of near poverty. The book that Victor and I wrote is about the second group of people in the near poor category. These are people who, for the most part, are actually upwardly mobile into this category. Many of them were below the poverty line and have had years of experience of true hardship. Some of them were on welfare and they worked their way out of it. But they are inner city families, black and brown, who have, by dint of their own extraordinary hard work and struggle, found their ways actually into better jobs that placed them in this category of the near poor rather than the really poor or the desperately poor. So in some respects, they represent an optimistic story about what's possible. They moved into this category in the late 90s and the early part of this decade when labor markets tightened, when opportunities opened up, and they were there to grab them. So in some respects, the story we have to tell tonight is one of optimism and upward mobility, but not security. It's not a station in life they can depend on, and therein lies the rub. They work as transit workers, they work as daycare providers, teachers' aides, hospital attendants, clerical assistants, security guards, and often they have more than one of those jobs. That is, the only way they're able to stay above the poverty line is to have more than one job, to have more than one worker in the household, sometimes to press their teenage and adult children into the labor force and pool all that income in a way that lifts the household above the poverty line but not because everyone in it is earning wages that are above poverty wages. It's because it's a collective strategy, in a sense, to pool their income. You might have called them working class, and in fact, some of my colleagues have used this term, but I want to distinguish them from the people we typically think of as working class, blue-collar, unionized, industrial workers, an, an ever-shrinking proportion of the American labor force, sadly. That's who I think of typically when I think of the working class. These people that we're going to talk about tonight tend to be in the white collar world, the low end of the service sector. They are very rarely unionized unless they've been able to get public sector jobs, one of the last bastions of unionized labor. And when they are able to get unionized jobs, that does lift their wages. There is no question about it. The, the near collapse of the union movement has had a devastating effect on the average wages of American workers. Hence, these people know very well that to find a unionized job is to find the holy grail of employment, especially for inner city workers. It's important for us to recognize that they don't claim much of the world of benefits. And by benefits, I mean the benefits we offer to people at the bottom, like public assistance, Medicaid, they earn too much money for Medicaid, so there are a large proportion of the uninsured population fall into this group of the near poor. They also don't get the benefits that people like me get, mortgage deductions, for example. That is a huge subsidy to the American middle class, and they don't get that either because on the whole, they're not homeowners. If they are homeowners, it's because they're elderly and they're no longer in the active labor force, so their incomes have shrunk and they've managed to hold on to those homes. But the working age near poor tend not to be homeowners. So they miss all the benefits that are associated uh, with that status. 
It's important for us to understand that these are the people who were pulled into the American labor market by rising wages and to some degree pushed into it by welfare reform. But the only way they stay in this category of the near poor, again, is by working as many hours as they possibly can because their wages are not high enough on their own. Now, what are the consequences of this for family life? And this is important not just because we care about families, but if we're thinking about the fate of the generation to follow them, the children in this group, we have to understand what their daily lives are like as well. And basically, those are lives lived more or less without the presence of their parents. Their parents are working. They are traveling, as some of the families chronicled in this book do, out of Manhattan, out of the ethnic neighborhoods of the northern part of Manhattan, to New Jersey 90 minutes away to pack perfume bottles in a factory, and 90 minutes home. So you leave home at 7 o'clock in the morning. You get home at 8 o'clock at night. You're completely exhausted. Are you able to watch over your kids doing their homework? Not really. Supposing you were able to, would you have the skill and the resources to make sure they were learning their times tables? Probably not, but at least you would have been able in the past, perhaps, to look over their shoulders and make sure they were cracking the books. Now you're too tired to do that. At the same time, your children are facing the regime of no child left behind with this barrage of standardized tests, the consequences of which are quite serious, especially for kids long around the age of eight. So if you are a third grader in New York City and you fail the No Child Left Behind standardized tests, you get held back in school. And if you get held back in school, we know what that means over the long run. Over the long run, it means you're far more likely to be a high school dropout because you become age inappropriate in your class and that tends to discourage kids and it tends to lead them straight out of the educational system altogether. So two policy communities, one that was driving welfare reform and to some degree driving wage increases, and the other one driving school reform, really never talked to one another about what was going to happen behind the closed doors of a family's life. But the families that Victor and I have studied have to grapple with this every day. And they can't take their kids to the library. And those notices that keep coming from, you know, the principal, Mrs. Jones, who says, are you taking your kid to the library every week? Are you making sure that they're doing all their reading? Because we can't get them over these test hurdles by ourselves in the school district. We need your help. You know, there's not a whole lot that that achingly tired mother packing the perfume bottles can do to make sure that actually happens. If a missing class worker loses her job, her family is plunged below the poverty line within about a week. Why would you be losing your job? Well, there are lots of reasons. You could get laid off, and as we crest into the recession that our former president here, Larry Summers, says we're headed for, uh, you can expect to see a lot more missing class households fall down below the poverty line as a result. But one of the most common reasons why people in this group lose their jobs is if their kids get sick, they have to take time off to take care of them, and their employers don't take the attitude that Princeton University takes if my kid is sick. They don't get time off. They don't get paid if they take time off. They get fired if they take time off. And so the, the sort of cycle of, illness, of lack of insurance, lack of preventive care, illness, and labor market withdrawal tend to package together often for these families and leave them in rather desperate straits, even if they're doing everything they can to avoid that fate. Their children are also affected by the composition of the neighborhoods they live in. So the family that we start off with in this book, the Floyd family, lives in a neighborhood that's tipping over between what used to be a pretty rough ghetto and now is becoming a gentrified middle class neighborhood as the uh, high earners spilling out of Manhattan move into the part of Brooklyn where they live. What does this mean for the grandchildren in the Floyd household whom they're raising? all seven of them. What it means is they are faced both with some opportunities that come from having more middle class kids in the schools they attend and the rough side of the ghetto that's still there. So when we look at the grandchildren in the Floyd household, we see the granddaughter who's doing really well. She is the star student of her school and she is benefiting from the presence and the aspirations of the middle class kids in that community. But if we look at her cousin, who also lives in that household, we see the flip side. 
captured by gangs, in trouble with the police. The police are always knocking on the door of the Floyd household because they know where to find those grandparents and they've got this kid in trouble. Or we look at the family that we studied, a family from Puerto Rico who when I first began meeting with them, the son was about nine years old or so, he was on the straight and narrow, he wasn't a brilliant student, but before his mom started packing those perfume bottles in New Jersey, she could look after him. I went with her to his middle school while she met with the counselors who were trying to keep the kid in school and make sure that he was doing better uh, than, than he had been. Um, but once she went into that labor force 12 hours a day, she couldn't look after her son, Omar, anymore very well. And today, he's in an upstate prison. And that's what happens to a lot of unsupervised inner city teenage boys if they live in neighborhoods that are either bounded by the rough spots or where their schools are, they are sharing their schools with kids who are into gangs and drugs. So there are problems that have to do with the unstable employment structure and interacting with healthcare, with an education system driving in one direction and a labor market or welfare system driving in another. But all the way around, what I want to say about these people is that we should really thank our lucky stars they exist. These are the bedrock of the nation. These are the people who do the jobs none of us want to do. They empty the bedpans in the hospital. They take care of the elderly. They help to raise our children in daycare centers. They run the MTA transit system. We can't do without them. Um, but we're not making their lives very much easier. And if we have time at the end in your questions, we can talk about how we might do a better job by them. Because really all they want is a stronger opportunity structure. They don't really want to be hooked into a benefit system. They've been there. It's not a very pleasant way to live, and that's not what they're looking for. They need better wages. They need union protections. They need to be able to have health care so that they can take care of their children or prevent them from getting sick. They need to avoid things like lead poisoning, which is rampant in the neighborhoods where they live. They need treatment for asthma which is also rampant in these neighborhoods. These are all conditions that actually can be dealt with, but not unless you've got a strong preventative health uh, campaign. Let me stop there and ask Victor to come to the podium to talk about some of the other issues that surround the lives of the near poor. Thanks again to EJ and the Cambridge Forum. I'm going to talk about the problems that the missing class have in getting, uh, getting quality health care and health insurance and the, the challenges they face in uh, saving money and building assets. In terms of health care, we find that the near poor are at great risk of being either uninsured or underinsured. Of the 47, 47 million uninsured people in America, a disproportionate number are poor or near poor. 24% of the poor and 21% of the near poor are uninsured compared to just 8% of those households that make over $75,000 a year. The near poor also tend to be underinsured. The Kaiser Family Foundation reports that a fifth of insured Americans are underinsured, which means that they face limits on medical coverage and also have substantial out-of-pocket medical expenses. The, uh, the problem with um, the, uh, the near poor is that many of them have decent jobs, but they, they lack the kind, of, the, the kind of financial cushion that could uh, protect them when an illness strikes. They're uninsured in that they're more, also more likely to skip medical care uh, that they need, and their lives are terribly unpredictable. One of the saddest stories among the families we profiled is the Hall family. Gloria Hall is a single mother raising two young children. She developed cancer and became sick, so sick that she had to stop working. She had insurance through her job in law enforcement, but she was underinsured. Her HMO refused to pay for um, the testing that would have caught her cancer earlier. Uh, then it refused to pay for the kind of state-of-the-art treatment that was recommended for her. And the sad irony is that once uh, Gloria lost her job and her income dropped, she was able to get that treatment, but it was through Medicaid, the health insurance program for the poor. Another health care issue facing the near poor is that they are at greater risk of chronic illnesses uh, to begin with because they live near pollution and poor housing. 
The poor, uh, in general, the poorer you are and the darker uh, uh, your skin, the greater risk you are of illness, uh, you the greater risk you have of getting illness, getting ill in this country, and the, the shorter life expectancy that you have. We see this in the higher rates of hypertension, stroke, uh, diabetes, and obesity among lower income and minority families. But of special concern is the effect of neighborhoods on the health of near poor families. For one thing, the quality of care that they have access to is sometimes substandard because they have to turn to public hospitals that are chronically understaffed. They also tend to live in neighborhoods with worse air quality and high levels of pollution. They live in housing that is deteriorating with vermin and, and lead paint. And pollution and poor housing, stock, poor housing stock are linked, as we know, to greater rates of lead poisoning, asthma, and other respiratory illnesses. And these conditions, not surprisingly, are more prevalent in uh, near poor households. We can see the effect of these uh, living conditions of health in an example of one of the families in our book, the Guerra family. Tamar and Victor Guerra have three sons, and all three of them suffer from chronic conditions associated with pollution. The oldest has asthma, uh, the middle son has uh, severe allergies, and the youngest son suffers from lead poisoning. It's especially difficult for near poor parents like the Garas to uh, deal with the, the, uh, their children's chronic illnesses because the parents work such long hours to make ends meet. For Tamar Gara, um, she found it difficult to take time off work of her factory job because um, there's no flexibility at her workplace. If she misses a lot of work, she can lose her job. The Garas also didn't have any kind of safety net underneath them. They had no insurance and paid in cash for every doctor's appointment. They didn't apply for public insurance through SCHIP, the uh, government's program to insure children from near poor households, uh, because they simply didn't know about it. And this is common. Uh, about 30% of uninsured children in this country uh, who are eligible for SCHIP don't apply because they, their parents simply don't know about it. Like many immigrants with poor English skills, uh, the Garas had difficulty learning about and getting these government benefits. And um, they're among, among just one of the many families that, uh, face, um, that face problems getting adequate health care in this country among the near poor. Another area that we examine in the book is the challenges that the near poor face in uh, building assets. And near poor households find it difficult to save. Uh, and part of the reason that is is because, because many of them do not have bank accounts. Of the 28 million Americans who do not have bank accounts, they're almost overwhelmingly uh, poor and near poor. Banks tend to discourage uh, uh, customers from these groups. They have closed their branches in near poor neighborhoods. They're encouraging people to move online to, uh, to bank, but that's not well suited for many near poor households. Banks are also charging larger fees when customers uh, put, don't put in a minimum amount of money, and that's not very uh, helpful for uh, near poor households who can't, might not necessarily be able to save thousands in their bank account. But without these bank accounts, near poor families have to spend a few bucks to buy a money order to pay a, uh, every kind of bill that they uh, have to pay. They have to uh, turn to um, check cashing ash outlets to uh, cash their paychecks they get uh, you know, every week or every other week. Another problem with not having a bank account is that the newer poor do not establish relationships with banks, so it's harder for them to get loans when they need them. So they have to turn to loan sharks and so-called payday advances that charge exorbitant rates of interest. The other difficulty that newer poor face in building assets is that it's hard for them to buy their own homes. As you know, owning a home in America is so crucial because it's, it's about uh, building financial stability. You can borrow against the value of your home when a crisis strikes and you need extra cash. Home ownership also provides a variety of benefits to the near poor uh, in terms of access to good schools for one's children. But for the near poor, uh, the rates of home ownership are much lower compared to other Americans. Their modest income makes, makes it difficult for them to get the loans necessary to buy a home. And we can see this in another example from a book, The Gervais Family. Uh, Rita Gervais is a single mother. She was once in the middle class, but dropped into the missing class because she got divorced and lost her husband's income. And as we describe in the book, she found it really difficult to get a loan um, to buy a home because her job as uh, owning a small daycare business uh, uh, didn't uh, set her up for um, an easy loan. Even when the near poor can get financing to buy a home, their ability to keep that home is far from certain. 
when rising interest rates prevent the near poor from making, the mortgage, from making mortgage payments, they can lose their homes. And there's also problems, as you know, with predatory lending, including so-called hit-and-run contractors who um, vastly overcharge for repairs, and when the owners can't pay, they can lose their homes. And one um, example of this is the Floyd family, who we profile in the book, who lost their one financial asset, their home, um, when a hit-run contractor um, made, uh, convinced them to uh, do some repairs. They signed some paperwork that they didn't understand, and they didn't know their rights. And there's a general lack of financial literacy among the poor, uh, as we see in the Floyds, uh, which makes them vulnerable to this kind of predation. And I'll stop there uh, so that we could have time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. You're joining us at Cambridge Forum, listening to Catherine Newman and Victor Tan Chen discussing their book, The Missing Class. Um, now, I'm going to, uh, I get the moderator's privilege of asking the first questions. Um, but first, I want to let you know about what the question asking is going to be like after I get done. You'll have to wait for me. Um, we're going to have an unusual format. The first two questions will be from women. We all know that women take, whether it's nature, nurture, culture, doesn't matter, take longer to formulate their questions and tend to get up in line way at the end and not get to ask. So women, start thinking now, because you're going first. And then after that, um, it'll be pretty much who gets to the mic, but if it ends up being all guys, I'm going to make them wait and push you women to ask some questions too. So first my questions, I'm going to sit down again. You said um, that the missing class that you were talking about were primarily black and brown. And that made me wonder about places like Southie and Dorchester. I mean, there's a lot of white, poor, and near poor. Is, am, I, am I wrong? Why? The people in this book are entirely black and brown. But if we were talking about this problem nationally, you would okay. be quite right. In fact, the missing class is predominantly white mm -hmm. um, and at a very high proportion of Hispanics. About a quarter of the nation's Hispanics fall into this category. Mm -hmm. So African Americans are slightly overrepresented in this group. Hispanics are way overrepresented in this group. And whites are the majority. In this particular book, because we were interested in the inner city missing class, this is entirely a minority population in this book. But you're quite right. Why? It, I mean, why, why were you interested there? Well, because I began many years ago studying this group of people. We followed them over a seven-year period. And I've written several books about these fam not these particular families, but about this population. Um, and this was a special study inaugurated by the MacArthur Foundation, uh, which was largely a national sample, but in New York City was specifically targeted to understand the minority perspective on aging, actually. So in New York City, the larger survey population from which these nine families were drawn was one-third black, one-third Puerto Rican, and one-third Dominican. I see. Uh, then my other question as I was reading the book was how do um, free market uh, theologians, oh, I mean, sorry, economists, um, <laughs> Uh, account for the structural barriers that you're talking about um, to prosperity. The, uh, the, if the idea is that all of us work, if we can work hard, we can do well, we, we all know that, that's deep in American belief systems. How do those economists, how do they account for this? Well, I think that most economists would point to, whether wherever they are on the political spectrum, would point to the enormous increase in inequality in the United States since the mid-1970s, in which we've seen a real sort of bipolar uh, distribution of income with those who are very well educated really running away, in a sense, with, uh, with the vast majority of income gains, and those who are poorly educated and lack what they would call human capital falling further and further behind. So I think that the standard economic explanation for this group of people would be that they're not very well educated, and that's true. Uh, they are actually better educated than those who are even further below uh, the income spectrum than they are, and that there are real uh, increasing structural barriers facing people who are at the bottom end of the educational spectrum. And I think that would be their principal explanation. Other 
economists of an earlier persuasion, uh, more left-wing persuasion, would probably say that the labor market is composed of segments, some of which seem rather impermeable, especially in periods of very high unemployment, which is not, interestingly, the period we were looking at. But in periods of high unemployment, people who enter the labor market at the bottom tend to be stuck there. They will churn around within it, but movement up above there will be blocked by a whole series of demographic restrictions, educational restrictions, and the structure of the labor market itself. What, I, what interested me earlier on in a series of books I wrote about the mobility of the working poor is that when the opposite economic conditions prevail, when we have very tight labor markets, very high levels of prosperity, very low inflation, very high growth, you do see people who looked like they were trapped before start to move up. And the group that we profile in this book actually followed that pathway. They moved up into these jobs, precarious as they are and as difficult as their lives are, it's a whole lot better than it was before when they were below the poverty line in even more desperate uh, conditions. And that upward movement was facilitated by the high growth period of the late 90s and the early part of this decade, which was the period in which the data for this book was collected. Do you want to add to that, Victor? Yes. Um, I want to emphasize, too, um, that the missing class or in some ways, they, they present a challenge to the standard economic model that, that says that anyone who works hard can succeed in this country. And uh, it actually shouldn't be a surprise to us, because if you look at the rates of relative mobility in, in America, the chances that if you're poor that you'll become rich, um, it's actually lower here than it is in Canada, Canada Germany, and France. So um, there is a, there's a structural problem uh, with mobility in, in this country. And uh, I think that the near poor highlight that, uh, that fragility, that the chance, the, the opportunities that they have uh, to succeed are, as we describe in the book, uh, quite tenuous. And uh, there has to be more uh, done to help to make sure that their hard work and effort um, actually amounts to something. Time to start lining up at the mic. Um, and while I wait for the women to raise up on. Oh, I didn't see that there's someone back there. OK, you have to come to, up to the mic if you want to ask a question. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to uh, just ask my follow up, um, which is um, while well, the rest of you are lining up. Um, I, I think I wasn't asking so much about. I think I'm asking. How do the Chicago School free market economists talk about the fact that it's just harder, that it costs more to be poor and near poor than it costs to be middle class or upper middle class or wealthy? Uh, they would account for it exactly as I explained, that this is a function of the human capital you bring to the table. And if you don't have very much of it, you end up churning at the bottom, and that's all that your human capital will buy you. That would be the traditional economist explanation, I think, for the phenomenon that we're reporting. They would say as well that there are market failures, and things like the banking system or, that, or predatory lending that, that Victor was talking about, those are market failures. We have them. The question is, what should we do about them? And there, is, there lies a rub or a divergence of opinion. Okay. I mean, it's all about education for, um, you know, the lack of education in, the, in these uh, groups. Uh, but uh, I guess we have to look at the fact that there are huge barriers to getting education for a lot of these uh, uh, families, uh, the adult workers in, in, uh, in the families. In this country, uh, the educational system, the higher educational system, is, is uh, geared towards um, people, in, you know, in their, in their 20s. And, uh, uh, but a lot of, uh, you know, older people in our sample uh, were getting education, uh, trying to go to back to community college, get uh, a degree that could help them uh, get promoted in their jobs uh, later on. But it's just harder because you know the financial aid system isn't uh, geared to help them. And um, there's obviously barriers that they have too, uh, obstacles they have in terms of uh, you know caring for their kids and, and just the uh, stresses of work as well. Question. Um, thank you very much for, for this work. I really appreciate it. Uh, I wanted, uh, and so I just, when you closed, you were talking about structural, structural problems and solutions. So now, could you maybe offer us what you see as solution? How do you deal with it, you know? Um, I, Excellent question. Thank you for that opening. <laughs> I can say a lot, but. Well, why don't we start, and then you can chime in. Um, there are a number of, uh, 
recommendations we make at the end of this book that derive from what we've learned from studying these families and where we think there really are important things we can do. So they start cradle to grave, and let's start with the cradle. Um, we need a high quality early childhood education system. I don't mean just daycare, I mean high quality early childhood education. It would pay for itself very quickly in the form of children who are better prepared for school, in the way in which it would level some of the differences between the families we're talking about who really can't do that for their children themselves, the way I can do that for my kids, and Victor will someday for his. Um, early childhood education prepares kids for school, makes it more likely that they'll succeed, and levels the differences. But right now, we are so far behind our competitor nations in Western Europe. If you are an Italian baby, uh, you are more or less at six months of age, eligible for an extremely well-structured, rich, af you know, uh, early childhood education system. A French child, an English child. I mean, you go down the list, and our competitor nations are investing heavily in this. Um, we need a better way of leveling the playing field for school-age children. So, you know, back in the day when uh, people were ridiculing midnight basketball and other forms of after-school activities, I never understood that ridicule. It's ridiculous. It is the most positive investment in making sure that kids, especially those whose parents are too busy working to do much for them constructively after school, actually have something positive to do after school. And that can include an academic component. And wherever it does, again, that pays off in helping kids over that hurdle, makes it more likely to keep them in school. Improving the schools themselves, providing better salaries for teachers and more incentives for the brightest and the best of our country to go into the teaching profession. What is more important than producing the next generation of highly qualified, literate, numerate people? Uh, if you look at teachers in Japan, you will see they are not only extremely well respected, but very well paid. Hence, really bright people become teachers in Japan. They are not sort of left over from something else. They are dedicated to this profession because they're rewarded for it. We see American teachers who are also very dedicated, but a thousand obstacles are placed in their way, including extremely low wages, which leads to, especially in the schools we looked at, very high turnover, very low levels of school insta you know, stability, principals that are trying to, to cope with kids who are moving around all the time and teachers who are moving around all the time. So there's nothing stable about the school year. Um, we need a better school to work transition system. You see, if you get me started, I'll be here all night. Um, and, and my all of these are, but I want to emphasize one thing so that I don't run away with this completely. These are not handouts. These are investments in the productivity of the nation. We reap enormous benefits from doing this, and we know that because after the World Wars, we created a GI Bill system. That was an, in, that was an investment in the education of an entire generation that built the modern American middle class. We know that because we invested in Social Security, and it, within a few years, broke what had been an almost permanent link between being elderly and being poor. So these are the investments we make in the well-being of the people of the nation. And that's not just for social justice reasons, although those reasons are there too. It's because it's the smart bottom line thing to do. And we are not doing that at the level that we need to. And that's what I meant by unfinished business. I just wanted to say that it seems to me that um, what, what we're talking about here would be uh, translated by uh, people in some other class that I know as entitlement programs and and that what I'm trying to say what I'm trying to say really is are. that this whole structure uh, this whole structure of a uh, struggling population is planned Th that's think, probably a longer story than we have time I to get into I think it's time tonight. that we started to see it in that way. <laughs> Victor, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, sure. Um, I just, I think the policy question is important. And, and beyond education, I think there's, there's four other areas that uh, are, are key to um, 
dealing with the problems of the near poor. And one is to make work pay. We have to uh, really support unions that could uh, uh, put pressures on employers to raise wages for uh, wor working Americans. And we forget that we built a, a strong middle class uh, uh, in large part due to the strength of, of unions in this country. Uh, also, uh, improving uh, subsidies for low wage workers. Uh, we do that for uh, the working poor. We should extend that to uh, cover uh, the near poor as well. Another area is broaden health care coverage. Uh, obviously, you know how important that is with so many uh, Americans uninsured. But uh, uh, you could see it, the, in the debates over uh, children's health insurance how contentious that is. But we really, uh, there's nothing more we could do uh, to help uh, working families and to make sure uh, that their children are, educate, are insured, that is, and uh, also the uh, adults. And uh, it seems that in Massachusetts, uh, you guys are experimenting a, a great deal in, in that regard. Uh, another area is encourage household savings. Uh, and we could do that through um, uh, uh, programs to match uh, contributions that uh, New York poor families give, uh, 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 have the government match that. And that's a great incentive for people to save. And again, it's a way, it's a way to create uh, uh, incentives, incentives to do, for people to do things that uh, uh, they should do but uh, perhaps can't. And uh, we'd also say that uh, 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 the last area is to, uh, um, to revitalize communities and really uh, uh, to um, focus on some partnerships, to, uh, public private partnerships that could bring in um, uh, the kind of stores and the kind of uh, financial uh, um, uh, resources that, that uh, near poor families need. Gals, you're letting me down. No questions whatsoever? Okay, thank you. Yes? This is just a follow-up on what you were just saying. Uh, I, I don't know the particulars, but I'm curious, it, it, is, does Head Start n is no longer funded? I mean, is that the kind of thing you were talking about Head and what's Start, happened with that? Head Start uh, was never funded in a way that permitted it to reach more than a fraction of the kids who were eligible. And it was a part-time program, which required parental contributions in terms of time and labor. So it never really functioned as a full-time daycare program. Uh, but what we know about Head Start, even as limited as it was, and I don't mean to uh, denigrate it in any way, it was a hugely important step forward, especially at the time it was created, was that it has more than paid off. We know because we've now followed the first generations of people who went through Head Start and when they crest into their 20s, we can see that their high school graduation rates are higher, their incar incarceration rates are lower. So again, Head Start, limited as it was, paid off very handsomely. What we need to do is take a program like Head Start, make it full time, year round, and not require parental time contributions because they just don't have the time. What role does immigration policy play in the undermining of uh, wage rates for folks in the missing class? That is an extremely complicated question about which economists, especially those here in the Cambridge neighborhood, do not agree at all. Um, you have economists like George, my former colleague George Borjas in the Kennedy School who is absolutely certain that the data show that large-scale immigration from Mexico has depressed the wages of the native-born minorities uh, who are competing for jobs. You have other economists like David Card at UC Berkeley who will say no. If you look at where immigrants tend to locate, they tend to locate in high growth areas. They tend, or uh, other sociologists who've studied the kind of job seeking behavior of immigrants and they point out what all of us know, which is that in general, immigrants take the jobs nobody else wants. So they're actually not competing that much against domestic labor because they're in niches that domestic labor doesn't occupy. This is such a ferocious debate that I personally don't feel like I have a very good independent handle on it. I have certainly seen in some inner city labor markets in Harlem, not in this study, but in, in Shoots and Ladders, an earlier book that I wrote, that there is a lot of competition in some niches between immigrants who are seeking low wage, minimum wage jobs and native born African Americans. There is no question in central Harlem that that was the case when I did that study. But there are other places in which that's absolutely clearly not the case because of this niche behavior. And the, in the end, I think what most economists would agree to is that whatever the effect is, it's actually pretty small. So where it happens, it's not, it's not a very big explanation for depressed wages relative to 
the other changes that have happened to the economy, the hard hit that low educated workers have taken in the labor force, the huge bump to college educated workers in the same labor force. That's the best uh, and fairly derivative secondhand answer I can give you. Uh, one of the questions I had was about the stories in your book and whether or not you have accounts of personal voice from the families that expresses whether or not they feel still self-motivated? Is there a sense of accomplishment? Is there a sense of hopelessness? Do you find a lot of anger? I'm just interested in how these families feel, since many of them really were upwardly mobile into the working poor. I hope you'll actually read the book, because you will hear their voices. Uh, Victor and I worked very hard to be sure that their voices take center stage. So it's not a book of, it really is not a book of statistics. It's a book of profiles, if you will, wrapped around policy issues. I would say that for the group we're looking at, um, life is often a struggle, but relative to where we found them in the beginning, they actually feel fairly optimistic about their lives as adults. They worry, as, as many of us do, about the fate of their children. And they, when they see them running off the rails, ending up on Rikers Island or you know, looking like they're going to flunk out of school, you know, they worry a lot about those kids. Um, and the families where, for example, one family we studied, a single mom uh, who is at the tail end of an abusive uh, marriage when I first met her, uh, who was more or less forced into the labor market by welfare reform, had been close to clinically depressed much of her adult life. But getting that job was an enormous boon to her. This woman really recovered from a serious depression just by getting out into the labor force because you can't be an honorable adult in the United States, not with our culture, if you aren't working. Uh, if you're an able-bodied adult, you, you, there is no way to rescue your sense of honor in this culture without being a worker. And her honor was in tatters before she went to work. Once she started working, you know, she really blossomed. I mean, it was quite incredible to watch this happen. And since I watched her over that seven-year period, I saw this unfold. But at the same time, you look at her two-year-old, who was placed in what we might euphemistically call family daycare, meaning her grandmother was taking care of her during the day in a, in a rundown home with drug addicts wandering in and out. And that two-year-old had, at the time, a two-word vocabulary, no and shut up. That's all that kid could say. And I spent a fair amount of time around that little girl, and it was frightening to see what she might be imitating. You know, who knows what she was hearing all day long in her so-called uh, daycare. But her mother really didn't have a choice. There wasn't anywhere else she could leave her. She didn't have any, enough money, and there was no alternative being offered in her neighborhood that was going to be better than what... In fact, she felt glad, lucky, that she had at least a dependable grandmother to place that, that child with. So if we look at the trajectory of these two people in the same family, where we assume that what's good for one is good for all, no, what we see is what really was beneficial for that mother could actually be ruining that child. And when we look at the older children in that family who grew up when that mom was out of the labor force, okay, she was very depressed, but she was a very good mother. She made sure they went to the library every day. She, I watched her them rack up gold stars as they completed the 25 books they were supposed to read over the summer. She was very active in the PTA at their elementary school, and it was a rough elementary school. So her presence guaranteed that her kids would get the best teachers she could get them to. She was vigilant, and everybody in that school knew her. But once she went to work, you know, within about a year, nobody knew her anymore, and she couldn't be vigilant over them. And we started to see real educational problems crop up in the older kids who'd never had problems. In, in one of the families we looked at, you know, the one kid who had been recommended to skip a grade from first grade to third grade, within six months, he, they were getting notices with red scrawling writing all over them. Your child is about to flunk the no child left behind test. So we, I think as a society, we underestimate how important, if not parental inputs, then inputs from the rest of us through a subsidized system of childcare matter in pulling those children over those hurdles. But if you ask, how do the adults feel about their lives? They look at themselves as miracle workers. They've moved from being, you know, working on a factory floor where, you know, one woman we studied was, you know, cutting her hands every day on machinery to today where she is the central node 
in a doctor's office where she designed the software system that makes that doctor's office uh, very productive. And, and they've given her so many raises that you know she's now up to $35,000 a year, which for her, a former factory worker who didn't speak a word of English when she got here from, from the Dominican Republic at the age of 18, that's, that's pretty miraculous. And she feels really good about that. Of course, that 35,000 has to support five people. So it's not a fortune, but relative to what she had, it's tremendous. So one of the things we were trying to do in this book is to make all of us become more clear-eyed and not assume that a policy that might be beneficial for one is beneficial for everybody. It could actually be quite detrimental to the next generation. Victor? Uh, yes, just briefly. Um, this, as Caddy pointed out, a lot of these families were very optimistic about um, uh, their chances, and uh, when they when they failed in a uh, uh, in, in um, their movement up the ladder, they blame themselves, uh, uh, and that's uh, you know a, a feature of American society that we're very individual individualistic in our analysis of uh, success and failure. Failure, and that's uh, uh, in some extent a good thing. But uh, as social scientists, you have to uh, we we focus on some of the structural problems that also uh, stand in the way of these families uh, succeeding, and that's uh, a large part of the analysis in the book it focuses on those uh, barriers that uh, many families face, even if they're not aware of them. Uh, I'm interested in asking the question about the role of religion among this uh, class. Um, we often hear of uh, the heroic difficulties that especially working women face, uh, but they find uh, grace in the weekend to carry them through. And I'm wondering if you found that kind of thing, uh, and uh, if you could uh, uh, address that, especially among the um, uh, most poor folks who probably are on the uh, still on the uh, uh, immigration side. I, I would assume that the religious life that they're living is also connected to their uh, local uh, um, language, uh, cultural environment. That is a very interesting question and one which I confess we uh, neglected to a large extent. And that may be partly just the issues that we began uh, with in focusing in this book. I don't remember a heavy religious element in their lives. They're certainly, they certainly were deriving, some of them, especially the immigrants among them, the recent immigrants among them, uh, often turned to church-related social networks that were helpful to them. Um, the African Americans among them often were several generations away from what I would think of as the most churched members of their families. That is, the oldest of them who came up from the South were deeply embedded in churches. You get down two, three more generations and it's a little bit less so. They certainly did not speak about religion and faith as an enormously powerful part of their lives, though the woman who was really ill with cancer certainly had a deep spiritual sense about her and found great um, benefit in, in the music of the church. You know, when she was really feeling awful and her cancer problems were really getting her down. She would often sort of close her eyes and listen to gospel music and other musical traditions drawn from the church. Um, but this is probably more an artifact of how we did the study than it is uh, necessarily a, a clear reflection on their own feelings about faith. Do we have another question? I wanted to follow up on my last question about immigration, getting back to another potential source of the destabilization of the wage structure of the missing class, which is what Margaret Thatcher used to refer to prior to the Blair administration as the only way, which was accept the fact of globalization and accept the fact of the gradual uh, shrinking of the welfare state. And now we're visiting that again with President Sarkozy in France. I'm wondering if you could comment on the pressure of both immigration and increasing globalization and pro uh, producing uh, manufactured goods in other countries at w uh, much lower wage rates is a pressure that may be inevitable in terms of how it's going to impact this group. Uh, that's a very good question, which once again, we don't take up really in this book, to be honest, but it is an important question. I think the United States in general is facing some very serious challenges from low wage countries, India, China, especially as they inve are investing very heavily in education themselves and ramping up their workforces uh, in ways that we, we should uh, emulate. 
I would say that if we look at the countries of Western Europe with the most generous welfare benefits, the Scandinavian countries, the social democratic countries, we see very high rates of productivity in those countries, really high rates of productivity. They're taking the high road strategy. They are losing the lowest level jobs, and that's a problem for their immigrant populations. But in general, if we look at those who are employed as, those, as opposed to those who are out of the labor force in Scandinavia, what you see is an upskilling strategy. They are actually willing to lose those bottom end jobs and protect the high end jobs, but it is not leading to any kind of diminution in productivity or market share for them. So this poses a real challenge, I think, to um, the more uh, free market view that we have no choice but to bust our unions and bust our wages um, in order to compete against world labor. We aren't going to be able, in my judgment, we are not going to be able to outstrip uh, China or India in terms of our competitiveness at the bottom end. Hence, our best bet is to follow the high road strategy of making ourselves as highly educated and highly skilled as possible and attempt to retain those jobs. Um, and we won't do that if we don't invest heavily in our education system. We will lose in every respect, in my opinion. I'm going to jump in with another question. Um, how, how do you see that? How has the subprime mortgage market collapse affected these families, if at all? Or is it? Th it affected the very first family that we opened the book with, the Floyd family, who, as Victor mentioned, um, owned a home. They inherited a home, actually. And, they, and like many poor families, they really couldn't keep it up. It developed leaks in the roof and problems with plumbing. Um, and because they are a relatively modest income family, when a contractor came along and said, I'll take care of that problem for you, just sign right here, they signed without really understanding what they signed. And what they signed were papers that were predatory lending from the very beginning, usurious interest rates. They signed away their rights to the property if they missed a single payment, and they missed a single payment, and that was it. And today, I mean, I find this quite poignant, they live more or less across the street from the house they lost. They live in a one-bedroom apartment with nine people. And they can look across the street and see that home, which was their own, uh, you know, their own at one time and, the, and a source of equity that would have been very important to them. The subprime lending market is going to have a huge, the implosion of it will have a huge impact on these people because those who were able to afford mortgages at all were probably in this end of the market because subprime is for people with weak credit ratings or insufficient assets to, in, with a traditional mortgage to afford it. And, um, you know, ironically, we've seen a huge increase in the rate of home ownership among modest income, not this far down, but modest income and minority households in the United States over the last 15 years. And my guess is a goodly chunk of that's going to evaporate in the next six months because this subprime implosion is going to take those families down. And we need to understand that subprime by itself is not that bad a thing. I mean, it's important that people have access to credit even if they're not, you know, upper middle class with a huge bank account. Predatory lending is a kind of subprime. It's not the same thing. Predatory lending is structured in a way that it is, is intended to rip people off. It's, in, it's structured in a way that it's intending to take those assets. Not all subprime lenders are predatory lenders, and we need to do a lot more to regulate that system and drive predatory lenders out of business. We're going to see a lot of people who have scrimped and saved and for whom this asset is their one bulwark against real economic disaster, lose that margin. They are going to lose that margin. Yes. I'm very concerned about the anti-immigrant uh, uh, climate emerging today, especially in the uh, political debate. I've had my turn at the microphone. I'm turning around looking. Is anybody ready to come up? I'll yield before I make my comment, because I'd rather hear from somebody else. Are you ready? Yes. You've mentioned several things, policy changes that could be made, investing in education, preschool education, matching assets to build nest eggs. Those are very idealistic goals. What do you see happening in Washington, in states that are moving us toward those goals? 
I think we're going to have to wait uh, to the next election because we need a different cast of characters and a very solid progressive majority in Congress in order to move in that direction. But I actually am reasonably optimistic. I don't know how Victor feels about this. Um, because I do think that there is a more general appreciation for the fix we've gotten ourselves into through speculative lending, through you know, the, the runaway um, assets and wages of those at the very top, and, and the vast majority of people who are feeling pinched. When I've done NPR programs on this book, and I know Victor has had the same experience, even though this book is really about, in many ways, the success stories of the inner city, most of the people who call into NPR are in the other group. They're in the group that's downwardly mobile into this population. When I talk to people in New Hampshire, uh, in Iowa Public Radio, Wisconsin Public Radio, all of the radio stations that our wonderful publishers, Beacon Press, has arranged for us to, uh, to participate in, in NPR programs through. Um, the people that we hear from over the phone are people who have lost their jobs and fallen into this group, and they are hurting in serious ways, and my hope is they're going to go to the polls.